And all of those things uh like profuse implants. You understand? So like the real solution is going back into the garden. Mm. Yeah. Especially especially during this time where you know, it doesn't matter what the issue is, whether we're talking about the coronavirus or we're talking about cancer, like the solution is our immune system. So uh, let's let's speak about it from a post pre and post segregation, right? And Dr. Africa was telling me that we did better when we weren't allowed in their stores. We mm -hmm. weren't allowed their buildings. We weren't allowed to go to their restaurants. We weren't because we had to grow our own food and it was organic. Right. So what would you say to people who are watching this thinking, well, you know, I need to go to Whole Foods. Would you would you recommend them to start their own cooperatives, start their own um, natural uh, health food stores? Or would you recommend them to just find what they can where they're at? I mean, my first recommendation is grow your own food because that's the real solution. You know, mm -hmm. so the first solution is even if you don't grow everything, grow something. Mm hmm you know, I've gone to like a lot of the tree pantries where you can pick up a fruit tree, you can pick up, you know, uh, seeds for um, kale, whatever it may be, but grow something, mm -hmm. right? Or have plants indoors. So that's the first solution. And then if you don't have a green thumb and that's mm -hmm. not in you, um, find a local organic farmer. And people think they don't exist in urban areas, but they mm -hmm. do. I mean, especially like, you know, I'm very familiar with Atlanta. And in Atlanta, there's at least four or five black organic farmers who make the best produce. Mm -hmm. And not only do they make it, they show you how to make it. They show you how to create a garden. Even if you don't have land, they show you how to make a garden on the ledge of your window. So those are the real solutions. Like, you know, Whole Foods and... It doesn't matter what the grocery store, they can always control your food supply. You understand? Like if they decide to not sh have 20% of the grocery store be dedicated to produce, then they can change that percentage and now you only got 5%. But if so you're what? going to... Your experience in Japan, what was that like? Speak a bit about that because there's a lot of people who think that this American diet, this. European diet is the be all and end all of foods, but I've studied Oriental foods. I've actually studied um, Okinawa. I've studied um, the China study. I've looked at uh, the Ayurvedic system, the Dravidians, yeah. India, and lots of the Hunza people um, who you yeah. know live for a hundred and they eat mainly almond. Uh, what is it? Almond. Uh, almond kernels or something like that with lots of B17 in it. So right. just people what what that area in Japan is like for food. Yeah, so I lived in Okinawa, Japan. And and for those who don't know, they have the highest number of centenarians. People who live to 100, they die in their sleep, no disease. And so I lived there for three years. And every weekend, I would go to the northern part of the island where I would just sit with elders, you know, for hours. And... I would see people 92, 95, 102, riding bikes uphill, farming, you know, doing things that people in their 60s can't do in Western societies. And so that was the first thing that triggered me. And then the second thing were a lot of the philosophies they incorporated. You know, I talked a little bit about my book, but one of the philosophies they call is called Hada Hachibu. Wait a second. Is your IG Dr. Holistic or DR Holistic? Uh, D-O-C-T-O-R, Holistic. Okay. Uh, yeah, carry on. You were saying the word. Yeah. yeah, so they have a principle or philosophy in Okinawa, Japan called Harahachibu. And in Japanese, that means eat only to 80%. And that's mm -hmm. scientifically proven because your, bra your brain has a 20% lag time. Meaning when you get to 80%, you're already really full. Your brain just has a little time to catch up with it. And every morning, they would have people go out to the sea to get seaweed. And we know seaweeds are high in minerals. They're high, they're high in iodine. They're high in all the things that you need and don't get 
from a lot of the fruits that we get in ex uh, vegetables we get in Western society. They would do herbal teas like mugwort and turmeric tea. You know, uh, they if they ate meat, it was only to season. So it would be small cubes of meat. It was never like a handful of meat like we eat in society. Mm -hmm. And so after living there for about three years and seeing how, not only how they live, but also going back into the, the Americans had records where mm -hmm. after they bombed Okinawa and bombed Japan, they recorded what they were eating back then and compared it how they were eating in the 2000s. And then so you got to see, like, if, say, for instance, one of the locals married, like, a local soldier and moved to America. Mm -hmm. You would hear the elders talk about how they moved to America, they got <laughs> overweight, they got sick, they moved back home, adopted the diet that their grandparents had and got well and got lean. And so it was this proof in the pudding that is not the fact that you know, we're genetically dispositioned to be obese, to have high blood pressure, to have diabetes. It's the diet. And that proved it. You know, having, you know, a niece or a granddaughter move to America, get all these Western diseases, come back, adopt the Okinawan diet, and all of a sudden they're healthy again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's easy to be plant-based there? Super easy because most there's so many farmers there. So like the same way you could go to like a farmer's market in your local city, there's several farmer's markets there. There's also several several farmers there as well. So it's really easy to be um, plant-based there as well. Now what's not easy is to be plant-based and only eat out because there's not a lot of vegan, vegetarian restaurants there. But if you wanna go and actually make your own food, it's very easy to be vegan there. Okay. so. Um, the next question was, what was your time like in Thailand? Thailand was beautiful, man, because I went to, I, I, I discovered one of my favorite restaurants in Bangkok right before I was leaving to move to Chiang Mai. And the person told me that all the recipes that they were making, they came from a chef who was from Chiang Mai. And so I went up there to learn from the chef and turns out he's not only a chef, but he's a herbalist. And so I learned a lot about how they incorporate herbs into their foods. And so that's one thing that I teach here now is whenever you're making a green smoothie, one of the things that people quite often don't do is add an herb in there. And so that's what I always do. Like I'm adding in basil, parsley, cilantro, lemon balm, those types of things because herbs pull out heavy metals. And unfortunately, in Western societies, we have a lot of heavy metals, not only in our water, as you probably heard about in Flint, Michigan, uh, having the lead in their water. And people thought that was an isolated incident, but it wasn't an isolated incident. Actually, they discovered that that's true in all major cities. They have lead in the water. But that's the importance of incorporating herbs into your uh, diet. And that's what I learned a lot in um, China. And also, I don't know if you tried it, but the Pasana um, meditation uh, there as well. And essentially what that is, is you're going, you go into like uh, a monastery and mm -hmm. you can't speak for like 10, 20, 30 days. So there's no talking at all. You can't read a book. There's no, there's nothing you can do to occupy your mind. Like you can't talk, you can't speak. And so I did that for a while too. How was that? Um, man, it's, it's, I think it was like, I have a lot of stuff like self-conversation, I like to read a lot. So for me, that was the most difficult part is not being able to read. So the first couple of days were really tough. I don't really have a problem with not talking a lot. I'm good with that, but not being able to read, not being able to listen to music, that sort of thing, like not being able to busy myself, like that was the tough part probably for the first three to four days. And then you kind of, your mind kind of quiets itself and then at that point, you can kind of sit still, be still. How would you um, decalcify your, your organs? People are talking about that. Decalcifying your, your organs or your penile gland? Or... So I think one of the ways you do that is with food. So food is one of the avenues you could take to do that. 
because when you say decalcifying, the reason why it became calcified in the first place is because of the acidity in your body. See, calcium is the most alkaline mineral there is in the body. It's what we, like, whenever you're very acidic, what the body does and it's, it's ingenious is it pulls calcium because it's so alkaline to buffer the acidity, right? Unfortunately, 99% of all the calcium in our body is in our bones and teeth. Mm -hmm. So that's the unfortunate side effect. But to decalcify, you got to alkalize your body. And the way you alkalize your body is with, you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, and primarily fruits. But the other way is alkalizing every aspect of your life, alkalizing the music you listen to, you know, and make sure that's a high vibration. Alkalizing the things you watch and read, you know, alkalizing the environment around you, like the people around you. These things actually change your vibration in your body, which can decalcify your pineal gland or any organ for that matter. What advice would you have to men for prostate health and to not get prostate cancer? Because a lot of us are getting prostate cancer. Mm. And I always tell men and women the same thing, that at the same rate that men are getting prostate cancer, it's the same rate that women are getting breast cancer and cervical cancer, right? And I always tell men specifically, there's certain things that cause what they call the PSA, mm -hmm. um, which is the antigen that is associated with your prostate that lets us know that your prostate is inflamed, right? When it becomes inflamed, it's because you're eating things and that are inflamed. And not only that, you have a toxic gut too. So one of the one of the main triggers is things like eggs and dairy. Those things trigger, you know, your inflammation in your body. Okay. So you have to get rid of the eggs and the dairy and the meat also. Uh, you have to always think in terms of like what's the baseline cause of the disease, like with prostate cancer. The way, the way that they actually measure prostate cancer is the inflammation. How inflamed is the prostate? And the other thing is you have to look at the anatomy. The prostate sits right between the genitals and also the anus, okay? All right, so it's sitting right between the genitals and the anus. Okay, so it's sitting right there near the colon. Okay, if you eat a very toxic diet, if you're very constipated, your bowels at some point will start to leak. And of course, given, given the anatomy of where your body is and where the prostate is, it will leak in that area and cause inflammation and acidity. So the first thing you have to do is alkalize the diet with fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. The second thing you have to do is incorporate things that actually reduce the inflammation in the body. So a lot of omega-3s, uh, that can be in the form of chia seeds, flat seeds, avocados, just healthy fats in general. Uh, and I think the tertiary thing is to stay hydrated. And the other thing you can do to kind of speed up the process is detox. And mm -hmm. when I say detox, you can do a fast. You could do like a herbal detox. Like, you know, I always suggest with people because I believe that, you know, they always say herbs are for the, for the healing of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I think when people need to be healed, it means that in some shape, form, they're toxic. You understand? Mm -hmm. And, you know, fasting can do that, but a lot of people, for some reason, don't believe in it. Even though, like, they may be super religious and every, you know, Messiah has had a fasting period where they gain clarity and health. Um, but fasting will not only give you clarity, but it will cleanse your body as well. So, you know, that's one form of it, fasting. The other form is detoxification. And then the other form is alkalizing with a plant-based lifestyle. Okay. And um, the next thing is eyesight, because I see enough people that are wearing glasses and every single year they have to get a prescription or get reevaluated, get an eye test and get a different pair of glasses because their eyes, generally speaking, are degenerating because they continue to wear these lenses that do the focusing for yep. them. Um, yep. What would you say to people who have an inflamed optic nerve and need to start doing eye exercise, 
exercise and, and what foods would you say to, for them to start eating or not eat in order for their eyesight to get better? Well, you, the key word you used was inflame. So if, anytime it's inflamed, it means you did something to inflame it. So you got to first, I always say like the key to healing is the first do no harm, harm right? So you have to remove the things that will was causing the harm in the beginning because a lot of people try to skip that step. And I, I think a lot of herbalists let people get by too. Like they'll come into the herb shop and they'll say, hey, I have diabetes, hey, I have this glaucoma, what can you do for me? They give them the herb and let them walk out the store. They've done them a disservice because they didn't teach them what caused the issue in the first place because our body's normal state is to be in this optimal state of health, right? Like it's not normal for us to just not have good eyesight, but it's become a norm because what happens is we use all these processed things and crutches in society now that abuse our health. We watch a lot of TV, right? We are using bifocals before we even try to correct the issue up on our own. And what I mean by that is in India and Ayurvedic medicine, they have like these eye exercises that you do every day, right? To build the strength up in your eyesight. Because when you don't lose it, when you don't use it, you lose it. So a lot of people don't have that tension in the muscles in their eyesight, so they lose it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that's one way that you can do it. Just go on YouTube and look it up. Like look up eye exercises to improve uh, eyesight. And so that's one way. And then the other thing is, eating a lot of anti-inflammatory foods, uh, which is very important because when the source of the issue is, now that you're not using it, now you're having to stare more. This is gonna cause an issue with the pupil of the eye or the lens of the eye. And then at that point, now you gotta correct the issue with a corrective lens. Right. And now that is going to create inflammation in the eye. You understand? So now you gotta do something, incorporate things in your diet that is gonna reduce the inflammation. Right. And again, that, that goes right back to the same things. You know, the chia seeds, the flax seeds, the healthy fats, you understand? Eating a lot of fruits, which are hydrating. And then the third thing I'll say is, and this is why a lot of people have that yellow tint in their eye, the eye starts to get brown, is they eat a lot of fried foods. And what happens is that cholesterol gets stuck in the humerus of the eye. You understand? And that's what causes some people to have these dot, these floating dots. They call them floaters. When they look, they're seeing this floating dot when they look. So you have to decrease the amount of uh, fried foods or the amount of oils that you're using in your food, too. Okay. And also liver stress as well to make them send bile into their eye as well. Right. Mm. Okay. So... Um, the next thing I was going to ask you is, for people who have palpitations, I mean, there's a variety of reasons why people have palpitations. Right, right, right. Because um, there's an emotion attached to each organ, the heart is fear, the liver is depression, the kidneys is anxiety. People right, right now have palpitations, and they're scared, and they need to sort it out. What would you say that they should do first? Well, I think the first thing is to understand that the heart is a, an electric organ. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that. Because it's electric, you have to understand that there's certain things that we put in our bodies that are electric. Like they're always talking about electric foods. Mm -hmm. And what makes the foods electric is the minerals. It's the mineral content that makes things electric. Like when I say iron... In the outside world, you understand like iron is metal and I can stick a magnet to it and we'll stick to it. You understand? But iron in the body is just as electric. It will pull minerals towards it also. You understand? So that's why it's so important to eat foods that are high in iron because iron is not only going to pull, not iron is not only going to go inside the cell and allow you to have oxygen inside of the cell, which is why a lot of people, especially who are black, who have sickle cell, their cells sickle. What that means is the cell turns into like a C mm -hmm. instead of being round. It sickles on itself and kind of uh, shrinks in inside of itself. 
is because oxygen isn't getting inside of the cell. Iron isn't getting inside of the cell. You understand? And so if you incorporate the right kind of foods in your diet and you get rid of all the toxicity, which is poisoning the inside of your cell, you're going to be able to allow iron inside of the cell. If you allow iron inside of the cell, that's going to pull in, not, that's on, not only going to create hemoglobin, but it's going to pull other minerals towards it too. You understand? So that's why it's so, so important to understand that. Go back around again. Right, right. So, so now the cell has not only you're eating the right foods, now it has hydration. It's just like a grape compared to a raisin. The only difference is hydration. And a lot mm -hmm. of people aren't drinking enough water. And you, if you think about it, like, we lose about two and a half liters every day. That, that doesn't matter if you exercise or you're a couch potato. You're going to lose two and a half liters. You're going to urinate. You're going to have a bowel movement. You're going to sweat. Even if you don't feel the sweat come off of you, when you're breathing, you're breathing out vapors, you're going to get rid of two and a half liters every day. So the minimum you should be drinking every day is two and a half liters. And I guarantee you, most people don't drink a liter a day, let alone two and a half liters. There's one thing I wanted to say to people that I, uh, like it was an evolutionary trait why our cells started to sickle. It was a reaction to um, us getting malaria in Africa and the malaria couldn't exist in a sickle cell. Um, but we were able to still function perfectly well yep with diet in Africa um, and and um, just a, a thing on the iron thing that these iron supplements are bullshit because most of them are not plant-based and nope. they are mineral based you cannot eat iron and get like from the ground and get iron out of it in your cell because there's, there's different mineral families there's human minerals, there's plant minerals, there's earth minerals. Right. right. You go from earth minerals, you aren't going to get out of it what you need to get out of it. That's why particular plants that are high in iron grow on iron mineral deposits in the ground so it can turn it into a liquid assimilable form that you can then... Exactly. ...of cells in your body. So if people are stuck for iron right now, what can they buy for you to get some iron? I have an iron supplement. And it's not extracts, it's from plants. It's mm -hmm. dandelion, it's sarsaparilla, which is really high in iron. It's nettle, it's quassia. You mentioned that before. Um, it's real herbs in there. And so mm -hmm. what I've seen in the last couple of months, people pur purchasing my iron supplements, a lot of people who have iron deficiency or anemia, they, drink, they eat a lot of ice. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things I hear people say is I go from I went from eating five or six cups of ice a day to one cup of ice. Mm. That lets me know that something's changed in the body. Why do you I, I that's one of the things that uh anemia triggers. Okay. Uh it may be the structure of water. You understand? Okay. It may be the structure of water, not the actual water, meaning iron in a crystalline state that is ice. But that triggers a lot of people. Like when they have anemia, uh, and a lot of people on here, if you have anemia and you eat a lot of ice, comment below. But a lot of people eat a lot of ice when they, also yellow dock is also in the root, uh, in the herb as well. But um, they eat a lot of ice. They have a lot of cold uh, chills. A lot of women with their cycles, the cycles are very heavy when they have anemia. Their cycles are longer. And when people take the iron supplement, the cycles are a little bit lighter and a little bit shorter. So that's one of the things that I always recommend because it's the right type of iron that our bodies can, our bodies truly can absorb. The kind of iron that you purchase, like iron sulfate and iron gluconate from the pharmacy, is not real iron. It's mm -hmm. iron straight from a rock. You understand? And plants have this alchemist ability to take that same iron from a rock, but they convert it into a form that can be absorbed into the body. Most of the minerals that are taken out of the soil, they're taken from the soil, they're taken from rocks. Even when you drink natural spring water, the reason why the spring water can be alkaline natural spring water is because as the, as the, as the water evaporated into the, the sky and then it rained back down to the mountain and then it ran down the mountain, which has rocks in it, 
and then it went through the river, which has rocks in it. Plants and water is capable of pulling minerals out and converting it into a form that our bodies not only recognize, but that form of iron or mineral our bodies can also absorb. So you can't just go, the, the plants are the middleman and the plug that we have to go through. If you skip the plug and go straight to the source, it will not be converted into the form that your body will understand or be able to absorb. So that's why I always recommend to people. Okay, so buy is iron supplement. And the other thing is, is if you're getting fruits from fruits and roots, get cacao pods because cacao is the highest fruit yep. iron. And don't just suck the flesh. Chew the actual cocoa bean because it's high in magnesium as well. If you yep. sleep for women on the cycle, get your iron in, and it's going to uh, help you um, manage that, that cycle. And that's and so important you mentioned that, bro, because this is people are always looking at minerals and diseases like separate. Like mm -hmm. iron and magnesium, like they, they always have like a brother. Like so for magnesium, the brother to magnesium is calcium. You understand? Mm -hmm. And with testosterone, it has a sister, estrogen. You understand? They always have a following. They always have a partner. And mm -hmm. they are always in the right ratios when you get them from herbs and you get them from fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. So that's the importance of going out and getting it from a natural source versus just going to somewhere and getting iron by itself. It doesn't work like that in nature. It's always in a correct ratio and it's always paired together. You know, the other day I seen this thing, this this account posted something saying, you know, you see the red thing and it's like a COVID warning. They said, COVID warning, boosting your immunity will not stop coronavirus. <laughs> it's foolishness, man. There's a lot of propaganda going on right now. And um, the only thing I could tell people is this. You have to take a moment and go into the common sense corner. Like, you have to understand, like, okay, this is a body. Mm. And I've been given certain things, right? Like, when I came into the world, like, I didn't have to learn how to breathe. I didn't have to teach myself how to have a heart rate. I didn't have to teach myself how to, how to think. There are things that are just in us. And so it's the same thing with our health. Like our health came with some immunity. If you had, let's say for instance, if your mom had a natural childbirth, if she breastfed you, if you played in the dirt, nature figured out a way to get you some immunity. You understand? Mm -hmm. So there's always processes. It doesn't matter what disease it is. You can go back to ancient Egypt. They have the Ebers papyrus papers. There's over 48 different diseases in there they, they have treatments for with herbs. And this is over 5,000 years ago. And they have diabetes in there. They have cancer in there. They have all the diseases we have today. So nothing has changed. Nothing has changed at all. Like the same things that work for that genius in Egypt who built the pyramids, who was responsible for a lot of the knowledge that we have today, even today in modern society, those same herbs and plants work today. And I always this, tell people, go ahead. This was, this was the man that wrote the Ebus Papyrus. Indeed, indeed. So that was the multi-genius, not only who was a doctor, who was an engineer, who was an architect, who was purely a genius. Over 5,000 years ago, they wrote remedies using plants and natural met medicines to heal yourself. So I always tell people, plants have a, at least a five to 10,000 10, year history of healing humans. Modern medicine has been created in the last 100 years. It only has 100 years of history. And I can tell you, if you look at the last 100 years of human history and health, our health has declined in the last 100 years. It's not, it's not modern medicine. Let's call it for what it is. It's white man medicine. Exactly. And so I always tell people, they call it traditional medicine, but it really plant medicine is traditional medicine. That's what we traditionally use for the last 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. So it's the traditional medicine. 
Modern medicine is just that. It's drugs. Mm. It's not it's pharmaceuticals. It's not medicine at all. For right. it to be medicine, it has to be medicinal. It has mm. to end with a cure. You mm. can't you don't have to take it for the rest of your life. If you become dependent on something, it is an addiction. It is not medicine. Because I went to Iraq when I was younger, I was in the military.